We are all born to stand out in our own unique way, but unfortunately, it is very easy to want to fit in, to be like everyone else surrounding you, to have what they have. And also, in a lot of utopian societies, it is described like that as well. However, when you're a four-year-old Iranian girl going to a Catholic school in the 80s, in a very small village in Antwerp, where your teachers are nuns, whatever you do, you cannot fit in. Trust me. Or when um, someone comes and says hello for the first time, and he introduces himself as, hi, I'm Kuhn, and you start laughing, and they're like looking very strange at you, but you only know that it means in Farsi, hello, I'm an ass, because it's the same thing, actually. So for me, yeah, fitting in wasn't always an option, but at the end, it really was the perfect fit for myself as a person. And my story actually began, as Vanessa also indicated, uh, in Iran. I'm a product of Iran. And um, I think yeah, it's good to know what Iran was like in the 70s before the revolution. We had a Shah, which was a kind of an emperor, and the Shah was very liberal. People could vote. Um, there was education, which was accessible for all. There were a lot of technological innovations. And there was so many cultural activities in Iran at that time. You had um, American festivals, you had European festivals, you had theater plays, everything, actually. Um, every time I see the, the, the picture book of my mom of the 70s, uh, which was then, you see her with, like, you know, Charlie Angel's hair, Farah Fawcett, hot pants, which is, like, non-thinkable now. And, yeah, you see um, a lot of vibrant uh, places, a lot of, yeah, um, concerts that, they, that she went to. But um, after a while, that Western influence was getting to the conservative Islamic countries, uh, parties there. And in addition to that, uh, the oil prices were increased by the Shah. And with those two aspects, the Western uh, alliances were broken because yeah, they didn't want the increase in price. There were a lot of negative um, input from the people uh, from outside of Iran and inside of Iran. And at the end, demonstrations began, actually. But they were very calm. It was more protesting. But after a while, it got really ugly, and at the end, there was a very hard, yeah, fundamental Islamic power grab, which led to the Islamic State. And that was yeah, a big, big worry for my mom and dad, because uh, they were married. My mom was Muslim, my dad was a Jew. And in the eyes of the law there, it was a crime that they were married, because they weren't from the same race. So they had plans, actually, to flee Iran as soon as possible and keep their marriage as they had until that moment as a secret. But then, unfortunately, strategy, yeah, we had the biggest strategy which could, could be there. Uh, the two brothers of my mom, which were pro-Shah, they were against uh, the Islamic regime and also uh, protesting on one of the days. Uh, they were both killed during a, a rally. And unfortunately, the day that my grandfather heard that his two sons were killed, he had a heart attack and he died the same day, actually, as well. And I think after a couple of months later, my grandmother, from grief, also passed away, unfortunately. So my mom, after having this big of a tragedy in a couple of months, yeah, she decided that she didn't want to leave because, yeah, she had her sister still. She wanted to be with the remaining family that she still had there. And also, yeah, she wanted to be close by the grace of her brothers. It was a way too big of a tragedy to just leave behind you and go further. And, yeah, she, always, she also tells me the story about going to the graves of, um, yeah, her brothers. But because they were pro-Shah, um, they 
were buried in a specific place in the cemetery for those protesting uh, people, uh, where you, wouldn't, you weren't allowed to put a grave tomb on because they were against the regime at that moment. And the more uglier you behaved, the better, actually, you were allowed to do so in that part of, of the cemetery. But still, that didn't stop my mom. She still uh, went, went there. And also with her sisters, she had still family there. She, she really didn't want to abandon it. And then after a while, in that really dark period, uh, some light came as well. Um, I was born, this is me, when I was four years old. Um, and I think yeah, she started working again, and uh, life is getting livable again. I think that's the only way you can describe that. Um, until one sunny morning in the streets of Tehran, while me and my mom were walking, me in this dress, this is really why I, I chose this, this picture, um, and we were stopped by the morality police. I don't know if you know about that. It's actually uh, people which don't have a uniform, and they're in between uh, the regular people. You can't recognize them at all. And they're there to see if you don't wear makeup, you have your scarf uh, correctly, uh, that you don't talk with, with guys who aren't uh, family or, uh, or brothers, for example. And she stopped my mom, and she told her, like, yeah, you have to cover her shoulders up. She's, she's bare. It's not okay that she's, she's having this kind of dress. And my mom was like, oh, come on, just leave it. She's only four years old. She's not thinking about being bare or not. And at that moment, she, she showed my mom a razor, and she told her, or you cover her arms, or I'll give you a, a reason to cover her arms forever. And I think for my mom, that moment was like, enough is enough, and let's go. Um, even with, with all her, her remaining family, the, the little that she had was still living there. And then the puzzling started, actually. So um, when we uh, wanted to flee Iran, uh, we wanted to go to the US, because at that time, it was considered to be the land of the free. I think with the Trump, <laughs> it won't be that much anymore. But um, yeah, and also with the history of uh, the American festivals that we had, there were a lot of connections there already. Um, yeah, we were looking for going to the US, but it was very difficult to get a visa to get to the US, because it was the enemy uh, of the uh, Islamic um, State, which was um, generated at the moment. So we puzzled. We were like, OK, how can we get to the US without alarming the authorities? And where can we get a visa? And this is actually how I got, we got in, in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, we found a visa for Brussels, and then from Brussels we were going to leave to Canada, and then from Canada we were going to take a car and get over the, the border and then arrive at the United States of America. That was a dream. So we, we then left to, to Brussels, and uh, we already had a contact who made us a visa to get into Brussels, and we also uh, talked with him, and he was like, yeah, you're going to stay there for, for a couple of, uh, of days, and I have a contact there, and he'll help you with your visa to Canada. But as you know, I'm standing here on a stage in Leuven, in Belgium. Uh, <laughs> the guy didn't keep his word, and uh, we, yeah, for, for us at that moment, we got stuck in Brussels. Um, and um, yeah, I think after a couple of days, we didn't have any money anymore, so we also went to the authorities, and they uh, led us to, I don't know if you know it, it's at Klein Castelje, which is in Brussels, and we stayed there a couple of months, and fortunately, we got a home uh, to go and live in Capelle. It's a very small village in the northern part of Antwerp, and yeah, we, we went there, but you have to, Imagine this, you come in Brussels, uh, you, you only know Farsi, so that's a completely different alphabet. Uh, there is no Google Translate, there's no Facebook, there are no cell phones, you have to go and buy your, your telephone card to phone your family, of course. You don't have any Skype to get into contact with the people that you left behind, of course. And, well, yeah, well, we're trying to manage uh, me, I was four years old, and I think my mom at that moment was as old as I am now, with a kid in the streets with an alphabet you don't recognize, with, with signs that you don't, don't know what they're, they're saying. 
But we were very, very fortunate because I think uh, one day my mom, in tears, went into a bookshop and she was like, I got this letter, but I have no idea what it means. Can you please help me? I, I need a dictionary so I can know what, what, what I'm getting from the, from the authorities. And we met Els there, which is still the best uh, friend of my mom until this day. And she also learned me, learned me how to write, how to read, and also to give you this talk today as, as well, of course. And I think after a while, we got very much yeah, into the Belgian way of life. And we also got our citizenship. And we did try to go to the US, to the US afterwards. Uh, my dad, I didn't tell this yet, did manage to go to the US while we were stranded in, in Brussels, so he was there still. And then we tried to go there and, and follow him and, and, and see him again. But it is very difficult when you're apart for such a long moment and a lot of things have happened and you don't have a lot of communication. The, the relationship got strained, of course. And for me personally, I was very homesick. For me, Belgium was my home. I, I wanted to come back. And, and then I think we, we then decided to come back and make Belgium our permanent home and stay here like we've done for the last 30 years. But still then, I, sometimes I do f don't feel at home still, because every time that, I, that someone asks me, like, yeah, from, from where are you? Uh, I always say, yeah, I'm Belgian. And then the second question they always ask is, no, but from where are you really? Um, then I'm like, yeah, still Belgium. And then uh, the other way around, when, when you're with Iranian people, they're like, you're so strange. You really don't know what to do when you're with Iranians. I'm like, yeah, of course not. <laughs> I'm, I've been living in Belgium for four years. And the only Iranian uh, influence that I have is my mom still. So it's very little. And I really, for me, it was uh, troublesome because, yeah, it's very difficult to, to, to know what you are. You're like more citizen of no man's land. You don't have a real identity. You're stuck in um, not fitting in at all. Uh, again, and also being stuck in between what people uh, perceive as what you are and what you really feel that you are, of course. But to be honest, after a while when I got older, I saw that as being a big, big positive, not fitting in. Because when you don't fit in, you're forced to see, yeah, the world in a completely different perspective and also from different kind of views. Because you see, yeah, you're standing outside and you see, okay, let's, let's go for it. And I'm not trying to fit in anymore, but I'm trying to update myself every time I meet an aspiring person. I, I have a, an, an awesome job. I, I meet a lot of people, as, um, as you will do tonight as well. And you see, like, when you don't have a label or you don't have that box that you have to fit in, it's, you have much more room to be what you want to be, actually. You can update yourself, be the best version that you have, and steal the best things that you see from other people as well and make it your own and be the best uh, yeah, non-fitting uh, person that you can be, of course. So uh, with this, I would really like to invite you to not want to fit in all the time, to take some risks, to don't put yourself in a label all the time, in that box. Get out of it. You'll have way much room. Uh, take that road that's not taken that, that often anymore. Be inspired by people. And very important, never forget, your mind is like a parachute. If it's not open, it's not working. Thank you.